Welcome and thank you for joining us today. Uh, my name is Dr. Shauna Snyder. I'm also a board member for the Field Pair Alliance, and I'll be your moderator for today's fireside chat. Uh, this is our third annual fireside chat, and I'm really looking forward uh, to today's conversation with Dr. Carol Pasak. Um, I will give a better introduction to him a little bit later. Um, let me get some housekeeping things out of the way. Um, this program is brought to, brought to you by the Field Pair Alliance, whose mission is to empower patients with pheochromocytoma or paraganglioma, their families and medical professionals through advocacy, education, and global community support, while helping to advance research that accelerates treatments and cures. We'd also like to give a special thanks to Progenics today for making this webinar possible um, through an educational grant. Uh, before we begin, we are excited to share our end of year video with you all. Uh, we've had a very busy year at PPA, and um, so we'd like to give you some highlights. So here we go. Awesome. So in addition to all the things that we have accomplished this year, as you saw from the video, uh, we would like to remind everyone that through the end of the year, um, Field Pair Alliance is conducting our end of year fundraising drive. And your generous donation ensures that we are able to continue our mission of supporting those with Field Para, not only by providing up to date information on these tumors, but by giving programs like outreach to the newly diagnosed, our monthly peer, uh, our, excuse me, our monthly peer support meetings, our one-on-one -on -one peer support meetings, um, our healthcare provider education and outreach, our centers of excellence program, we have a lot of things going on. And through the end of the year, we are doing our end of year giving campaign. So if you're able to donate, we would greatly appreciate it. Um, simply go to feelpair.org and you'll see a donate button there. All right. So our disclaimer for today is that the information presented in, in, in this webinar is for educational purposes only and should not substitute the advice of your doctors and medical team because they have in-depth knowledge of your medical history and current situation. All right. Without further ado, uh, let's get into some questions and let me introduce Dr. Pasak. All right, he world famous, here he is. Um, I always like to start off with something fun, but before I do, uh, let me give you a quick introduction. And Dr. Pasak is a board certified endocrinologist and is chief of the section on medical neuroendocrinology and head of the Department of Endocrinology, Metabolism, Genetics, and Endocrine Oncology Affinity Group of the Eunice Kennedy Shriver National Institute of Child Health and Human Development of the Intramural NIH Research Program at Bethesda, Maryland. 
His transitional research, research has provided novel understanding of and treatments for patients with neuroendocrine tumors, especially pheochromocytoma and paraganglioma. Dr. Pasak established the International Symposia on Pheochromocytoma, the most internationally recognized meeting in his field. He was part of the Endocrine Society's 2014 Pheochromocytoma Task Force and currently serves as a member of the Journal of Clinical Endocrinology and Metabolism's editorial board. For more than 20 years, Dr. Pasak has developed and led an internationally recognized program on pheochromocytoma and paragangliomas, and he is among the most cited researcher in the field of pheo and paras worldwide. He is having about 2,000 citations per year. That's phenomenal. Um, he most recently won the Outstanding Clinical Investigator Award from the U.S. Endocrine Society, and I had the privilege to be there to see that. It was excellent. This prestigious award was presented to an internationally recognized clinical investigator for meritorious contributions to clinical research related to pathogenesis, pathophysiology, and therapy of endocrine disease. And then lastly, I would like to say this is always fun for me because Dr. Pasak is my own doctor. So I like to have a chat with him at the end of each year. This is our third one, and we try to have a little bit of fun with it. Uh, so welcome, Dr. Pasak. Shauna, thank you so much. You know, appreciate your introduction. It's uh, very nice of you, and uh, I appreciate your uh, wonderful words. Uh, and uh, absolutely very happy to be here today and uh, to answer some questions uh, uh, that patients will have and to, to actually uh, communicate with them. Although, you know, it's definitely, you know, virtual, like, you know, it used to be, you know, for several years, but I think, you know, we can have, you know, very good uh, interactive session today and I will be happy, you know, to navigate patients, you know, in the in terms of their management treatment, uh, as well as, you know, some future plans and uh, discuss, you know, how to put everything together in terms of their diagnosis. So once again, thank you so much uh, for the invitation. It's really great honor, you know, to be invited by FIO Para Alliance and also to be uh, that your uh, actually, or this session and seminar and webinar is supported by Progenix and by other entities. Thank you so much. Well, we are so glad that you're with us and we have a lot of questions today that have been submitted. I think this is the most number amount of questions that we have ever had. So I, I'm just gonna fire them at you today and we'll see how far we can we can get. Does that sound okay? I think it's okay, you know, I have unlimited time, you know, so we can spend, you know, a lot of time, you know, so that all, okay. you know, those who are asking, you know, will be happy, you know, with, you know, uh, that their questions will be, will be heard and answered. Okay, well, let's get going then. So the first one, uh, what recent developments in Fiopera are you most excited about? Yeah, that's that's interesting question. You know, so as you know that we have international symposium on pheochromocytoma in uh, October in Prague, and we had very good uh, experts, uh, international experts, um, uh, uh, focusing on pheochromocytoma paraganglioma. Uh, I think that you know the there are many. You know, I cannot go through all of them, but I think that we will be seeing you know some very interesting development. For example, development in the therapeutic options. We know, for example, that uh, radiotherapy is used, you know, for a patient with pheochromocytoma paraganglioma, whether it's, for example, Lutathera or Azedra. But I am predicting that there will be alpha emitters. So there are already some uh, clinical trials with alpha emitters. They will, that those alpha emitters will be very good, especially for patients who have practically only metastatic disease in bones, but it actually can hit also some other metastatic disease related to organs, but the bones will be actually uh, those uh, who um, 
those patients who may actually profit uh, really uh, very well. There will be so also a combination, for example, with Azedra and alpha emitters as well as uh, Lutatera and uh, alpha emitters. So I think it's coming very soon and I think that we will have, you know, some very interesting uh, outcomes. Something else, you know, is metabolomics. Metabolomics is really booming. Uh, Mm, uh, especially in pheochromocytoma paraganglioma, because many genes are related, for example, to Krebs cycle and other other pathways. And so metabolomics uh, can really serve as a very good indicators, not only, you know, for example, in diagnosis of uh, some pathogenic uh, mm, uh, variants. Uh, we use pathogenic variants, you know, for uh, lay public is mutations, but uh, also to predict, for example, responses to certain treatments as well as, you know, to perform follow up. About the metabolomics, there are already some very interesting uh, developments in terms of, uh, you know, some specific pathways. They are related to some uh, hereditary pheochromocytoma paragangliomas, for example, for uh, the the SDHB, succinate dehydrogenase subunit B, polyamine pathway and other pathways uh, that can be actually served as a target. So you will hear a lot about the metabolomics. We are still not there yet, you know, with everything, but I, uh, I predict in the three to five years, we will have some very interesting uh, data using metabolomics. The other... Um, uh, I would say part of pheochromocytoma paraganglioma research is uh, that there are immunotherapies. You know that immunotherapies are still limited uh, because we are using systemic immunotherapies. And I'm pretty sure that systemic the immunotherapies, and there are some very interesting data from MD Anderson, that approximately 40% of patients may respond uh, to systemic immunotherapies, but I predict uh, there will be some other options for uh, immunotherapies, like so-called intratumoral immunotherapies, when you don't actually put immunotherapy into IV, uh, into vein, into I, doing IV, but actually into directly into the tumor. And this is very important because, you know, toxicity is extremely low. You are not using so much compound, you know, the in terms of the price or cost, you know, is definitely much, much lower. And uh, you are actually uh, activating uh, the innate as well as adaptive immunity. We have some experimental data and some other groups. They also are working on uh, some actually um, uh, approaches for intratumoral immunotherapy. And I feel that not only in pheoc paraganglioma, but also in many, many tumors like Dr. Levy in Stanford, who is actually leading uh, um, researcher in intratumoral immunotherapy and others, they have a very, very promising data. There are also some very promising data in uh, at Hopkins, for example, with colon cancer. The Really, the outcomes are amazing. So I think that we will be moving uh, slowly to intratumoral immunotherapies. I am not saying that systemic immunotherapies will not be used, definitely not but intratumoral immunotherapies will definitely uh, definitely help. And then maybe lastly, uh, for example, we will have organoids, you know, for example, Dr. Dahia talk, you know, to, to in Prague, you know, about the organoids uh, that are very important because, you know, we can put, you know, the cells into, you know, certain cultures and manipulate those cells like they would behave. Uh, it would be like, you know, in the um, in certain environment and uh, we can uh, provide, you know, certain and perform certain experiments and to learn much more about, you know, the cells and transfer those results, uh, for example, uh, into uh, clinical uh, practice. And also I would like to say that there are some new genetic approaches, for example, single cell uh, 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 sequencing, uh, uh, for example, Dr. Todd Hill talk about that. And we know just now that uh, we can divide pheochromocytoma paragangliomas uh, uh, 
previously into three most important clusters, but the clusters have so-called subclusters and uh, Richard Todhill and uh, his groups. And there was international study. They found that there are many more subclusters. And I think that that would be very important in terms of when we are thinking about, you know, some therapeutic uh, uh, therapeutic options, and also because we we look at the uh, the cell, the specific cells, we can actually predict what those cells are actually doing, and how those cells are behaving. And for example, we have a support cells, so-called system to color cells, and they can. Uh, play important role in metastatic disease. So not only the cancer cells, but what is around actually uh, cancer cells. So we are expecting that there will be really very interesting uh, discoveries. Of course, the, the, it will take some. I predict that that would be maybe in a three to five years. And the last one, you know, artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence is very interesting, especially Dresden Group, uh, Dr. Christina Pampuraki, but also, you know, other groups that are coming with very interesting algorithm that, for example, if you know size of the tumor, if you know, for example, biochemical phenotype, you can know, you know, whether they have a hereditary or non-hereditary tumor. You know, you can put also the age, uh, and uh, uh, you can uh, also um, put uh, some other uh, characteristics of these tumors. You, ha you have a very good prediction, you know, what is the likelihood uh, of uh, getting uh, a pheochromocyto, uh, I mean, metastatic pheoparaganglioma. And I think that these apps, uh, I think that they, uh, uh, they have a mm, uh, certain, mm, you know, uh, I would say um, goal, you know, to put the apps together. And when the apps, you know, is approved and uh, everything goes well, you know, so physicians, for example, in the in the practice, they will be able to put, you know, some uh, such data and they will uh, they will tell the patient you have, for example, 70 percent likelihood to get a metastatic disease. Why it's important not to really scare the patients, but to tell them that they need, you know, much better uh, follow up and what needs to be done with those patients. I think that there will be huge, huge actually uh, step ahead. And it's not only about this, it's uh, also uh, in the radiology, we are working also in, uh, with artificial intelligence in the uh, radiology field, you know, to, uh, to predict, you know, if, when you see, for example, uh, the images from anatomical functional imaging uh, to actually predict, you know, how those patients can behave uh, in the future. So I think that we will be very interested. We will have some very interesting data in the future and uh, some new, actually, I would say, um, approaches, you know, how to actually uh, deal with all the patients and what we can expect, what we cannot expect, and also it will guide uh, some treatment options in the future. Fantastic. It's, it's wild to think how fast we are learning things and new developments and technologies are, are hopefully going to help our field. So that, that is fantastic news on all fronts. So you've mentioned a few um, therapies and some things like that. So let me, let me ask some follow-up questions that are related to some of those things um, that, that the audience has put out there. So this person asked how close is, and I don't know if I'm going to say it right, Belzutafan to being FDA approved. And can you give us an overview on how this will be used in Feopara? You know, so I don't know if I can be honest or not, you know, because, you know, it's, uh, there, uh, I don't know what is the audience today. You know, the Belzutifan is interesting drug, you know, it's if to alpha inhibitor. And this if to alpha inhibitor plays a very important role for the patients that they have a mutation in the so-called Krebs cycle is the cluster one, either cluster 1A or cluster 1B. The cluster 1A and B, you know, is either Krebs cycle or hypoxia signaling pathway when, for example, HIF2 alpha is stabilized. When I say the stabilized, it means that, you know, it's not degraded in proteasome in the cells. 
and has a little bit longer uh, biological half, half life and you know has actually option to go from cytoplasm to nucleus what is important that hif to alpha in the nucleus can affect many genes these uh, today approximately 1000 1500 genes that they are and most of these genes are related uh, to uh, transformation of the cell into the cancer cells and that is very very problematic so belzutifan is actually affecting uh, the um, the dimerization of the hif uh, and uh, which means you know the hif cannot be dimerized and cannot actually affect actually those genes and is not uh, is not uh, uh, moving you know from cytoplasm uh, to the nucleus. The data, you know, the Merck is actually uh, performing the study uh, with the Belsutifan, and uh, the study was done here at the NIH, uh, and uh, several institutions, not only in the US, but were to participate in the clinical uh, trial. I don't know the results of the clinical trial. I don't know how the Belzutifan will work. Uh, I have uh, some uh, my personal view when and in which patients Belzutifan uh, should be used. Uh, but Merck actually, uh, I would say, um, the the company suggested to use in many patients with pheochromocytoma, not only those that they are related to Krebs cycle as well as, for example, hypoxia signaling pathway. So we will see what the data actually will show. I think that Velzutifan well, should be used with cautions, should be used carefully, uh, should be used in certain number of patients. It should be not actually uh, used in most patients with pheochromocytoma, in everybody. So it has to be uh, very um carefully chosen which patients you know should have uh, or should be treated with uh, belzutifan unfortunately it's clinical trial belzutifan is not available although it can be actually available outside of the clinical trial but there are only very few patients those patients that they have a hif 2 alpha mutations they have a polycythemia hif 2 alpha mutations and others other problems belzutifan is extremely very good the drug you know for these patients and i think that those patients are the most important one uh, who should be treated with belzutifan but this is very small fraction of all patients you know with the pheochromocytoma and paraganglioma okay all right very good so the other question that someone has about uh kind of a study slash therapy that i guess we're looking at is the vitamin c study that was with the antioxidant pathway inhibitor brutazol. I think I'm saying that right, brutazol. Um, and it looks like maybe this was a study done in mice. Um, is, there, is there anything going on in the human world, human study with that uh, vitamin C and then this uh, brucetol? Yeah. So in terms of vitamin C, yes, you know, this was an experimental study that was done here at the NIH, and I think it was published in Clinical Cancer Research, if I remember, or one of those journals, you know, several years ago. It, you know, those are experimental studies, but there are also many studies, you know, in clinical medicine, especially in cancer research and with cancer patients, uh, and those studies may have, you know, some very good outcomes. Uh, so the problem is that the, the amount of vitamin C is pretty high. So calculating approximately for humans, it's about 70, milli 70 milligrams, or maybe more, you know, 70 grams, uh, not milligrams, 70 grams, you know, so every um, every few days. So this is this is really hefty dose. Also, is not affecting uh, actually uh, kidney, but the patients uh, they have to have an infusion at least you know twice a week, and there are only very few centers who uh, that will provide actually this amount of vitamin C. And of course, you know, it can be expensive. 
uh, the vitamin C, usually they will, they will provide vitamin C, but they will give you three grams, five grams, but this is something that is, uh, will never work uh, whatsoever. Because, you know, it's related to oxidative stress, increasing oxidative stress, and if there is high, actually, oxidative stress, the cell cancers are dying. So there are some uh, clinics uh, that could actually provide vitamin C, but every patient, they have to um, look at uh, those clinics uh, in the United States. We don't have, uh, uh, at the present time, a vitamin C study here at the NIH, but uh, I would say that uh, those... Uh, those studies could be actually very useful and again, especially in patients, for example, who have a higher risk of metastatic disease or they have already metastatic disease like SDHB. So uh, it's, it's not really available at the NIH, but I think it's still promising. Our group was the first one published about the vitamin C, that there was another group, you know, published uh, in the same journal, Clinical Cancer Research, you know, the French group uh, about vitamin C, the results are pretty much the same. So we are big believers that vitamin C can actually work. But as I said, you know, you have to have a very high doses. You have to have actually center who will provide it and you have to be dedicated to this treatment, which means that you have to get this treatment at least twice a week and for a longer period of time. And of course, you know, you can imagine, you know, that there will be, you know, some expensive, some other drugs, uh, Bursatol or some other ones, you know, there are something, you know, similar, you know, a little bit different, you know, because with glutathione pathway, etc. But also, you know, those studies, you know, can be uh, also promising and can uh, can have a very good uh, outcome in pheochromocytoma paraganglioma. But we never actually move from the experimental study to um, clinical studies and one of the reasons is that of course you know limited resources as well as uh, personnel but I think that if we put uh, together um, uh, the group of international scientists and for example ask for some specific international grants uh, we could actually start you know those studies whether those studies will be uh, will start in the United States or somewhere else, doesn't matter, but I think that we could actually entertain, you know, this idea and to consider about, you know, some uh, multi-institutional international study. Mm -hmm. I'm sure there will be several patients who would be willing to jump into that study. So you just I, I am pretty, give the I am word, pretty sure but I'm sure you'll I am have pretty sure. Yeah, because vitamin C is, you know, not harmful to the patients. And uh, right. there are really very good, very good data. Patients are doing well. Don't be afraid of, uh, of, for example, kidney failure or something like that. Definitely not. You know, there are some tests you have to go through before vitamin C infusion. But uh, um, otherwise, you know, the vitamin C is not harmful. Patients are doing well, feeling well. And it's also known in other cancers like pancreatic cancer and other type of cancers that there are some actually good outcome. All right, I'm gonna throw one more question about that sort of about medicine um, or a, a therapy, and then we'll move on to a couple other types of questions. All right, so this sure. one, it's a little bit more specific. Okay, so mm -hmm. um, a 15 year old girl, she has metastatic yeah. perianglioma. She's been, she has been on, let me see if I can say it right, tem temozolomide. Temozolomide? Temozolomide. Temozolomide, TMZ. Temoz okay. TMZ, okay, for 14 yeah. months. Um, she's going to continue taking, she has continued to take, and they're seeing a partial response. Uh, do you think combining capacitidamide bind with the TMZ should be discussed? Um, she's tolerating the TMC very well, and they're wondering if it would be a good time to introduce the Capacetabine. 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 
That's okay. Shana, I will help you. So uh, my answer you're, is no. You're going to have to teach so, me how to say these. Yeah, so my answer is no. If the patient is doing well, patient does not have, you know, big side effects, you know, everything is otherwise doing uh, well, you know, hematocrit, hemoglobin, you know, blood count, uh, patient is satisfied, patient has the response, you know, why to actually add capecitabin? It really depends. If the patient would not respond or would have, you know, some problems, we would maybe even stop the TMZ. But uh, if there would not be so much a response without any problems, yes, you can use uh, capecitabin uh, as well as uh, temozolomide, which is called CAMP10, and that would be that would be fine. But if the patient is really responding, why to add you know another drug? Because once we are adding another drug, there are always you know some side effects. Patient may not start feeling you know so well. He may be exhausted and everything. So we have many patients. I mean many. You know we have the good number of patients on uh, TMZ. We don't actually at capecitabin in case that patients are tolerating medication well, they are responding, they have a good life, you know, so without any very serious side effects or anything like that. So here I would keep it uh, as long as possible, the patient is responding to the therapy. Okay, that's great, excellent. And it's good to hear when patients respond, of course. All yeah, right, let's, let's have a few yeah, let's have a few different questions. Okay, so um, how often do you find that tumors grow back in the same location? Yeah, it depends on the genetic mutation. It depends, you know, how the tumor was removed, you know, whether it was removed, you know, by experienced surgeon and also the size of the tumor, if the tumor is attached to certain structure and where is the tumor located? Because, you know, sometimes those tumors can, cannot be really removed so well unless you do, for example, vascular reconstruction and even vascular reconstruction sometimes can be permitted, sometimes not. So there are many variables, you know, how to actually approach this problem. But overall, you know, if you have a very good and experienced surgeon and the tumor has, you know, good characteristics, uh, I would say so it's about maybe 10, 15 percent or something like that, sometimes even less, you know, for the, for those patients that they have a hereditary disease like MEN, etc. It can be sometimes higher, but it really depends on how this uh, the surgeon is skillful and also, as I said, the, the anatomic position of the tumor as well as the size of the, of the tumor. So I would not be so much afraid of the recurrent tumor because if the patient is uh, very well follow up, the recurrent tumors can be actually detected very early enough and can be removed is necessary because the patient can undergo second operation. Of course, we know second operation means, you know, there are already, the anatomy is distorted. There are, you know, some changes, but uh, actually, usually it can be, it can be done. Okay. So the recurrent tumors, okay. you know, I don't, think that they are so dangerous uh, compared to something if the patient is operated and developed, for example, in a one year, half year or something like that, metastatic tumor. This is a little bit, you know, different story. Okay. Okay. Very good. Mm -hmm. Okay. So this is a, this is a question that we, we hear a lot, especially out on, I think the Facebook support group. I think we hear this one a lot. All right. So if there's no evidence of another tumor, but a mm. patient is still dealing with symptoms, maybe like sporadic high blood pressure or sporadic high heart rate, uh, what direction would you tell them to go with their doctor? Yeah, so they have to go to the doctor, say that, you know, I had a pheochromocytoma paraganglima, the first test uh, needs to be done. Uh, usually we prefer plasma, some they prefer urine, catecholamines and metanephrine, especially metanephrines. Look here, if you have elevated metanephrines, means that, you know, the metanephrines are coming from catecholamines. Catecholamines are actually 
metabolizing into metanephrines, and sometimes they can be released into the circulation, which means that the patient may have actually symptoms related to recurrent or new, you know, or growing, you know, pheochromocytoma paraganglioma. If the metanephrines are negative, you know, so the usually patient does not have a pheochromocytoma paraganglioma because you remember, you know, the catecholamines are actually metabolized into the metanephrines. Metanephrines are released, you know, independently of catecholamines and uh, they are released practically every second. So the patient cannot have a symptoms and signs if they are not actually elevated metanephrines, which means if there is no production of catecholamines. The symptoms and signs are related to catecholamines. They have to be produced. Okay, metanephrines actually reflect that their produ pr production. And of course, in some uh, sometimes, you know, catecholamines can be released, you know, from the tumor. Not all of them will be, of course, uh, uh, metabolize into the metanephrines. So then when we know that the patient may have some uh, some problematic situation in terms of, uh, uh, for example, new or small pheochromocytoma slash paraganglioma. But if biochemistry is negative, how, can, how come that the patient may have uh, symptoms and signs? You cannot have symptoms and signs unless the biochemistry is positive. So they have anxiety, panic attacks, they have some type of nervousness into yeah, uh, under certain situation, social anxiety and everything. So it's, it's completely different, uh, I would say completely different situation how we approach those patients. I see many of those patients who are coming or consulting with me over the uh, internet and they think that they have a few paraganglioma, but when you look at the biochemistry is negative. Once biochemistry is negative, you cannot have symptoms and signs. Symptoms and signs are related to positive biochemistry, okay? And because the metanephrines are actually released, you know, 24 hours a day, you know, every second, every minute. So if they are not negative, if they, I mean, they are not positive, you can, you, you just don't have actually, pheochromocytoma, paraganglioma, you have something else. Okay. Would you recommend if, if a person was having signs or symptoms and they had <laughs> one test that, let's say it was maybe borderline, would you recommend them just have it again at some point down the road? Yes. Or Yes, I'm, absolutely. Okay. They, they, yeah. They First of all, you always ask them, what is the reason they have a borderline test? Did they did the, the collection was correct? Did they smoke? Did they had you know physical activity before uh, before test? Did they take any medication before test? Are they taking any medication on long period of time? For example, antidepressants, anti anti anxiety anti anxiety drugs. Uh, you know we have many children. You know we being treated with psychostimulants uh, for ADHD then of course it's obvious okay because they actually support increase or displacements of catecholamines from vesicles and they are releasing to circulation this is why for example those patients very often present with some palpitation and increased blood pressure this is my first question if there is any there is nothing there you know, so they don't have anything. Then, of course, you know, you measure blood pressure and I mean blood pressure, heart rate, and then you measure uh, plasma catecholamines and metanephrines. If there is something positive, you have to actually consider imaging, uh, imaging studies. But before, you have to be very sure that you don't have a false positivity on biochemical results. Therefore, you have to actually uh, look very, very carefully on their medication. Medication is number one. Once you uh, remove the medication and there is no medication, that is worrisome. And you have to start actually with the biochemical testing. And if the biochemical testing uh, comes positive, you are not sure, you can do the clonidine suppression test. But if you are sure, because the biochemical testing, the data are pretty high, it's at least uh, two times above the upper reference limit, you can actually start uh, uh, the imaging testing. Okay. Okay, that's good information for our audience. Mm -hmm. All right, mm -hmm. um, next question. Is metastatic pheochromocytoma curable? 
Yeah, metastatic pheochromocytoma is curable, and we have some patients who had metastatic pheochromocytoma and they were cured. But I have to tell patients that the cure comes, you know, very, very rarely, very seldom. Yes, we had some patients that they were cured, but this is uh, most, mm, you know, in most cases is really a rarity. Usually uh, the treatment we have just now uh, stabilize those tumors, decrease actually size of these tumors, decrease, you know, tumor burden, but, you know, those tumors to disappear is very, very difficult, very complicated. So, and also it depends on the size of the tumors. You know, if somebody has a three, four centimeter, don't count that the tumor will disappear with any uh, treatment modality. Sometimes with radiation, even the larger tumors can disappear, but uh, this is uh, also very uh, rare. Of course, we don't uh, know something about Belzutifan. The data has not, uh, not been released. Mm, we don't know anything about some other treatment options that are in the preparation, and they will be maybe very successful. We don't know anything about the immunotherapy. Immunotherapy with alpha emitters or combination, you know, some that's, you know, that it can be very good. And uh, so, but we don't have a data, uh, data yet. Uh, so I think in the future we will know uh, much more, but right now I can tell you from 100 patients, if do, two, three will respond the way that the tumors disappear completely, yes, they, they may, but it's extremely, extremely rare. Okay, but that's, that's some good news. Reasons to hold out hope. Yeah. All right. Um, next mm -hmm. question. Have you ever heard or seen patients who also have autonomic dysfunction or autonomic dysfunction symptoms because of their pheopara, you, you know, whether wherever it might be in the body? Yeah, so so usually not, uh, but there are exceptions. So because, you know, this is like apple and oranges, sympathetic or parasympathetic nervous system that it can be damaged, you know, uh, because of, you know, certain situation, including, for example, some immune reaction that is actually uh, against the uh, sympathetic or parasympathetic nervous system. And there are also situations that, for example, the patients may have uh, the problem uh, with those systems because uh, as an outcome of the surgery, okay? So, for example, the patients have carotid body tumor, you know, baroreflex, uh, you know, is affected, is dysfunctional, they can have a, you know, high blood pressure, etc. So, it depends what they have. Yes, they can be there together, with the pheochromocytoma slash paraganglioma and abnormal, you know, sympathetic or parasympathetic nervous uh, system. Those patients are pretty challenging because they have a lot of uh, morbidities. Uh, it's, a, it's very difficult, you know, to put everything together, you know, in terms of uh, diagnosis. And as I said, it's usually very... Uh, very uh, challenging. So, yes, it does exist, and we saw it, you know, before, but as I said, it's not very easy. Okay. Okay, so this person is going is asking about when would you advise a Zedra therapy, and they have a metastatic para, they've had Lutathera, um, and it was successful for three years, they just had a pet and the SUV went from 17 to 26, but the tumor size is stable. Um, they're also MIBG positive. So they're sort of asking at this point, would you start them on a Zedra? Yeah, so so fer uh, first uh, rule is, you know, so if you would like to start a Zedra or Lutatera after you had either one, you know, you have to have a positivity of the, uh, on the scans. That's number one. You cannot start, you know, if they are not positive. For example, they had the Lutatera, they would like to start Azedra. So they have to be positive on uh, uh, 132 um, 
On 23, I'm sorry, on 23, are you down at MIBG? That's absolutely must, okay? If they are not positive, mm -hmm. there's no, there's practically or usually no, no way. So if they are positive and they are positive previously on Lutatera, then you are thinking how much actual radiation they receive. If they receive Lutatera, they receive most likely about 800 millicuries. We don't like to go over 1,000, 1,200 millicuries because, you know, everything goes into, for example, the kidney uh, to be flushed out. And, you know, they can have secondary problem like, you know, secondary um, cancer, like, you know, the bladder cancer, because, you know, the radiation is affecting uh, bladder cells. However, mm -hmm. you know, so if you are deciding about that, you have to know also about the age of the patient and the, um, the their bone marrow suppression. If the age of the patient is, you know, uh, they are young patients, they are full of energy, their, their bone marrow is doing extremely well, I would definitely be in favor, you know, to get them a little bit, you know, small dose, for example, Azedra or Lutatera, whatever, you know, that was the first uh, and they say they would be, you know, second treatment. Why not? You know, that can be done. Mm -hmm. And there are some, I think, clinical trials. They are just now try to, trying that, you know, to do some combinations and these combinations can be of the interest. If I have somebody who is 80 years old, with, uh, with actually already suppressed bone marrow, because bone marrow can be suppressed not because of your paraganglioma, but, you know, based on their age, you know, so all this nutrition st status and everything, you know, so because, you know, when we are young, you know, it's a little bit different when we are older, and then you have to be careful. And you have to be careful to give them actually both you know, the modalities because they can really fail and they can uh, they can go into very complicated, difficult uh, conditions. So it's very, very, I, I can tell you it's very difficult. Plus, you know, bone marrow uh, suppressions can be very severe, especially in the older, uh, older patients. So, uh, so here we have to be definitely careful and see, you know, how we can approach the patients based on the positivity of each scan, previous actually dose, bone marrow suppression or uh, from the previous dose, as well as the age of the patients, because I think that those, uh, the, the most important rules are very important before you decide between A or, uh, a or B. And then you should know also the proliferation index of the tumors because there are some very interesting data, especially from Sweden, from Dr. Krona, if you have a so-called KI-67. This is proliferation index, and if the cells are growing very quickly, the proliferation index is high. So it is, uh, it is interesting that PRRT, I cannot talk about uh, MIBG, but, you know, the PRRT, you know, if you use, you know, the patient overall as, are not doing very well. You know, what is the reason of what is happening? Actually, we don't know yet, but you have to be very careful with that. So here you have to consult, you know, very good specialist, the, the one who knows, you know, about those modalities and will tell you the pros or will go... Uh, with you over the pros and cons, not to make mistake, because once you make mistake, you can be in very big trouble, you know, if, uh, because, you know, they uh, usually get bone marrow suppression, and that can be very problematic in terms of leuke leukemia, myelodysplastic syndrome, you know, bleeding, etc. So very important to have a specialist who knows yeah. about the opera and the treatments. Very important. Yeah, and they are very, they are very they're definitely very good specialists. You know, whether you go to UPenn, yeah. whether you go MD Anderson, uh, also NIH has uh, some uh, very interesting uh, experience. Uh, I think Johns Hopkins, Harvard, you know, so there are some very good uh, uh, University of Iowa. There are some very good experience uh, the physician, especially in the nuclear medicine, and uh, they have a very good view, you know, how to put everything together. Yes. Yes. And again, from Fiopera Alliance, we would highly recommend trying to get into a center of excellence where we know that we have some doctors uh, there so who are specialists. 
Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And if the patient want to go to center of excellence, they have to make absolutely sure that they have a very good experience with Azedra or Utatera or both, you know, so because those physicians will be the most knowledgeable to give them some very good uh, and solid and, uh, of course, you know, honest, fair information, you know, what to do and how to put the things together. Okay, because remember, everything is about the patient, it's not about the physicians. We can we can advise, right. we can support, but you know this uh, in favor or you know in the spirit of good outcome of the patient. So, and if we don't know, we should ask because there are some other physicians, you know, at a different institution, and not everybody knows everything. So, I think that the teamwork, you know, communication, exchange emails, information is definitely paramount here. Okay, very good. Um, all right, so here is a question. Um, can mm -hmm. my son, who has had a feel in the past, he has a confirmed mutation, go to the gym not knowing if he has a pheochromocytoma and exercise lightly with mild weights without overdoing it? So, so the question is about the son who once again, who had, you know, the, can you repeat, you know, the last part? Yep. So the son had a FIO, he does have a confirmed yeah. mutation and they want to, they want to yeah. know if he can go to the gym and exercise, basically not knowing if he has another one. Yeah, so he can, you know, but he, because he has a mutation, a so-called uh, pheochromocytoma susceptibility gene that could actually be related to uh, pheochromocytoma paraganglioma development, whether, you know, early at age or later on, you know, the patient should be tested. If the patient is tested, and I would here suggest at least biochemical testing if the imaging is not available or too expensive, and if everything is okay, which means, you know, the results are negative, patients can actually be in gym and can, uh, can exercise without any limitations. Okay. okay. If the patient right. would have some symptoms and signs related to pheochromocytoma, that the patient should have, for example, also EKG. I mean, EKG, you know, EKG would be also important, but it depends, you know, what would be the blood pressure and uh, heart rate, but uh, they should have definitely imaging studies. But usually if the catecholamines methanephrines are normal, you know, I doubt that there is pheochromocytoma paraganglioma, they can exercise freely. Okay. All right. Mm -hmm. This person is facing a surgery. They're concerned about a net in the pancreas and want to do a biopsy. All I've heard is not to biopsy. So what, what advice are we giving about biopsies these days? Yeah, biopsy, you know, so it depends, you know, if you are thinking about neuroendocrine tumor net, you know, so if, if I understood well, yes, you can do the biopsy. That's fine. But if you have a suspicion of pheochromocytoma paraganglioma, you should never biopsy, you know, the tumor. First of all, you can do the biochemical testing. If there's somebody has a pheochromocytoma, then it's more than half centimeter, methanephrines will be elevated. And once methanephrines are elevated and there is no other reason for false positive results, like the patient is taking medication. I told about the medication, ADHD medication that is uh, medication, for example, for anxiety, uh, uh, depression, etc. when we can have false positive results. If there are no actually uh, any uh, medications and patients still have sometimes palpitation, high blood pressure, and uh, of course, you know, uh, suspicion for pheochromocytoma paraganglioma, you have to measure catecholamines and methanephrines up front. This is very important, okay? Okay, okay, another question. I think this question comes up quite often also. I, I think we might've even had it last year. Um, when person, when people fly, um, and they're, or they're living in the higher altitudes, does this impact tumors, tumor growth? Um, does it, you know, talk about hypoxia, you know, kind of that whole thing that's going on there? 
you know so that comes every year and this uh, this every question, year. and i i can tell you honestly those patients that are related to cluster one uh, a or cluster one b the Krebs cycle as well as the hypoxia signaling pathway even not very well proven although dr baisal wrote you know some interesting article about you know the high altitude hypoxia and development of some tumors especially head and neck and you know the first study was published you know about hypoxia head and neck paragangliomas in andens you know so uh that was about 1973 or 74. so i'm big believer that hypoxia plays important role in development of these tumors this is why i am suggesting that patients who have certain type of mutations should never live in a high altitude because you know it will not uh, it will not get better it may be the same of course but most likely it will get worse you know, in the in the future, and especially those patients, for example, they have a HIF2 alpha mutation, they should all move actually to sea level. Uh, and there are many states that they they uh, have, you know, so they are at the sea level, and it's a uh, is very good. So yes, hypoxia, although not proven, you know, very well, you know, I feel that plays important role in the development of. Uh, Pheochromocytoma paraganglioma. And an interesting paper was published in New England Journal of Medicine from um, Dr. Dahia and, you know, so other co uh, co investigators and uh, Dr. Vadia. And uh, so they actually linked uh, the hypoxia to heart failure. As uh, and uh, of course, heart failure means you know that patients are hypoxic and actually developing more often uh, pheochromocytoma paraganglioma. So I am big believer of that, and I think that the patient should not live in higher altitude, you know, overall, you know. So this is this is the least what they can do uh, for themselves. Of course, you know, relocating is very complicated, difficult, including you know that's a high cost, but I think it pays for. But this is my okay. personal view because there are no actually good data evidence. Although I think, you know, Dr. Oh, uh, 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 Lauren Fishbein is actually working on that, you know, just uh, okay. just now. So nice. I think that we will hear in the future some very, uh, some interesting uh, conclusion or data, you know, from that in terms of high altitude. Okay. What, um, so let's say a patient has feel or para, they have a surgery. How yeah. often do you recommend biochemical testing and imaging after they've had their tumor removed? Yeah, so first of all, I would like to say that it depends on what kind of tumor they have and also based on the age you know, so as well as uh, genetic testing. If genetic testing is negative, somebody 70, 75 years old, you know, I doubt that, you know, those patients will develop another pheochromocytoma paraganglioma. I very much doubt. If the patient is very young, uh, so, and with some genetic abnormality, you know, first of all, about six to eight weeks after the operation, then about six months, after the operation or six to 12 months after the operation, at least, you know, the biochemical test. And uh, then, you know, so they should have at least, you know, every two, three years, uh, every year should have, you know, biochemistry. That is very important. And every two, three years, they should have imaging studies, whether they will have a CT, MRI, you know, so it's questionable because there are some argue, uh, arguments, you know, some are for CT, some are for, for MRI. Uh, I prefer sort of, you know, uh, the alternate approach, sometimes CT, sometimes MRI, so they reduce the number of radiation. And, uh, but they have to have uh, regular follow-up, as I said, every year, catecholamines, metanephrines, every three years uh, to have uh, anatomic, uh, 
imaging studies and uh, from time to time they can have also function imaging studies. Function means uh, nuclear medicine, phys nuclear medicine uh, studies and that are very, very important because sometimes they are definitely more sensitive than, than, <coughs> than anatomic imaging. Okay. Uh, by the All way, right. I wanted Very to good. say that they will. I wanted to say that there will be guidelines. Uh, hopefully, the, those guidelines will be published. There are in preparations a few guidelines about SDHD guidelines about SDHB. Very interesting guidelines will be about the pediatric pheochromocytomas, paragangliomas, and those who are in charge of those guidelines are really doing pretty uh, pretty good job. And I think that we will have some very good, uh, I would say, um, uh, recommendations for not only physicians, but for patients, what to do, you know, in, uh, if... Uh, Pheochromocytoma was found, or pheochromocytoma paraganglioma was removed. You know what would be the follow up? How often they will uh, have follow up? What kind of follow up? So, which means what kind of test? I think that that will be useful not only for healthcare professionals but also for the patients as well. Excellent. Yeah, that, that I'm sure a lot of patients would like to get their hands on that article when it gets published for sure. Uh, okay, I think we can maybe do one or two more and then we're, we're coming up on our time here. Um, okay, so um, have you found any link? There, there are a couple of questions that are asking about links to certain things. So there's, a, there's one question about have, have we found any links to uh, Pheopara and digestive problems? There's another one. Have we found any link to Pheopara and gallbladder or gallbladder polyps? So maybe just kind of talk in general, are there any relationships with Pheopara and maybe some other issues that people might have? Yeah, so if I start with gallbladder, most likely not, you know, unless, you know, the patients are, for example, or somatostatin analogs, like called somatostatin analogs, yes, that there are, you know, for example, uh, side effects, you know, because they have, for example, biliary colics, because, you know, somatostatin analogs decrease the peristalsis of gallbladder, and uh, they can have, you know, problems eating, you know, certain food, uh, fullness there, and sometimes they have to have their gallbladder to be removed. Whether When we talk about GI, that is interesting, because, you know, uh, it depends what kind of tumor they have. You know, there are, let's say, if these tumors are secreting or, uh, I mean, producing and releasing, uh, you know, catecholamines or non-producing catecholamines and, of course, non-releasing. If they are actually producing and releasing catecholamines, catecholamines decrease peristalsis and the patients are presenting with severe constipation. And that severe constipation is very difficult, very problematic, and very difficult to treat, actually. Uh, so, yes, they have a GI problems. Uh, and also, Dr. Lenders, Dr. Eisenhofer, and other, you know, investigators, you know, this is the Dresden group, yeah, and uh, in collaboration, with, of course, you know, with uh, some other um, uh, centers uh, found that uh, patients uh, with pheochromocytoma paragangliomas, despite what I said in terms of uh, constipation, they are overall losing the weight. So their body mass index is lower. We don't see it very often here at, uh, at the NIH slash United States, but, you know, so it's very interesting and uh, important, uh, important uh, observations. Yeah. So, yes, there are, there is, you know, some effect on a gastrointestinal system. And who knows, you know, there may be the, the, uh, the uh, effect on uh, microbiota. They can be other effects as well, but we are not there yet. You know, we want to study it. But it will take, you know, some time. But I think it's uh, definitely of the of the uh, interest. Uh, so this is how I um, can approach, you know, the GI system in patients with pheochromocytomas and uh, paragangliomas. There are some other also problems, but those are actually the important ones. Okay. Um, 
this might be our last one. I'm, I'm waiting on to hear if this is our last one or not. But let me ask one more while I wait. Um, can a para be so small that it is undetectable on the current imaging, but the person is actually having some symptoms? Ha, huh. that's an interesting question. Uh, my, uh, my answer is practically no. Because I will tell you, the okay. imaging studies are very, very, very good. You know, the their resolution, you know, so it's extremely, extremely good. Uh, CT scan can find the tumors a few millimeters. And uh, mm, MRI f mm, can be a little bit more uh, sometimes difficult, but, you know, also, you know, a few millimeters. The CT scan is a little bit different. It's usually between 1 to 1.5 centimeters. So going back, you know, you uh, you feel that, for example, the imaging studies would not find. If they did not find the pheochromocytoma paraganglioma, the tumor would be most likely less than half centimeter, yes? Especially for the anatomic yeah. imaging studies. Yeah. If it is less than 5, uh, 5, uh, 0.5 centimeter, they don't release so much catecholamines, and so the patients will practically not have any symptoms and signs, uh, especially under, for example, quiet conditions, uh, relaxing, because, you know, even they release, you know, certain amount, the patient will not actually feel it uh, so much, okay? So, so mm -hmm. usually the, the patients are coming with certain symptoms and signs related to catecholamine access if these tumors are, you know, sometimes close almost to one centimeter. They can, they can be smaller, but usually, you know, one centimeter, they are coming, you know, with the, uh, with the problem. Net, ne uh, nevertheless, if the tumor is approximately 0 0.6 centimeter, we can detect those tumors. They are, for example, with the plasma metanephrines, that is very good test to detect much smaller tumors. That's, for example, with the catecholamines. The only exceptions can be that they have a small tumors. And I told you, you know, they, they, don't, they don't have any symptoms and signs related to catecholamine excess, but they are in complicated situation, whether it's stress, accident, whether they get, you know, some specific uh, medication like metoclopramide or something like that, that will have a profound effect on these tumors. So even they are small and they are very active biochemically, they can release, you know, certain number, no, certain amount of catecholamines and therefore, you know, they can have actually problematic scenario. But this is very, very seldom. You have to have certain stimulus. If you don't have a certain stimulus and you are actually living ordinary life without any stimuli or anything like that, I doubt that they have a symptoms and signs because as I said, they are coming a little bit later, but you can have positive biochemistry. I told you if the tumor is approximately six millimeter and larger, metanephrines can be positive, but the symptoms and signs will usually not be there unless you have some trigger or something that will actually stimulate the, the tumor. Okay. All right. And this is sort of a similar, it goes along with this. This person says, mm -hmm. what if they have the signs and symptoms? They actually have four times the amount of norepinephrine, SDA mutation. Mother had the same issue, but no tumor has been found. Yeah, that's, that's if the tumor was not found, is the it's the question would be how come that the tumor was not found if there would be really uh, if the patient would really have a tumor i can tell you that the imaging studies are so good today that we will locate 99 percent of tumors and i guarantee wow. it okay so yep. so if the tumor was really not found and it's real that they don't have a pheochromocytoma paraganglioma and they have something else. And they have a something okay. else in terms of, you know, as I told you, they have a, some medication that is actually, you know, many patients are on antidepressants and they don't know and they are not told that they will have, 
you know, palpitations. They will have also, for example, you know, elevated blood pressure. Many patients uh, are actually, they have a sleep apnea. And they don't know any, oh. anything about sleep. Apnea. And sleep apnea increase actually sympathetic to the tone of sympathetic nervous system. So they will have elevated okay. catecholamines, especially norepinephrine. And they feel, you know, oh my God, you know, I have a pheochromocytoma paraganglioma, but I have a sleep apnea, but I don't know about, you know, and nobody told me. And how come mm. that I don't have a tumor if I have an elevated catecholamines? Okay, so and no, I have a, a hypertension. So, so there are some actually entities and some diseases that we have to be very careful. But I can tell you, if we do the imaging carefully, we do imaging properly. I guarantee you that practically 99% of tumors will be found in the body. These days, the imaging. Uh, uh, studies and modalities for patients with pheochromocytomas and paragangliomas are so good that we rarely miss, you know, some tumors. Very rarely. Wow. Okay. That's really good. And I, I think, you know, maybe then I hope some patients as they listen to this, if they've been on a, you know, trying to figure out what's wrong with them, it might be good to suggest that they get mm -hmm. a sleep study to find out if they have sleep apnea. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. They have to have a sleep study. Of course, they have to have, you know, some other exams like, you know, the, the, if they have a, you know, so panic attack, anxiety, although they, they don't have to be uh, uh, associated with elevated catecholamines, metanephrines, but they can have a high blood pressure, you know, palpitation, mm -hmm. etc. Also, we have to rule out drugs. You know, sometimes patients are using some medication and they feel, you know, this medication is not affecting catecholamines and this is not, this is actually not true. So, so we have to be very careful mm -hmm. with everything and to think about, you know, how to put, uh, put uh, certain, uh, certain things and certain situations together before we jump into the diagnosis. Yes, you have a pheochromocytoma paraganglioma, okay? Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. Um, okay. Let's do one more. And I think we're about to be out of our time. So let's end on, I have so many. Um, so this person has had, they had a CBT and they have what, what is being called right now a cyst on their kidney for several years, but no one is following them. What labs should they ask for to find out about this cyst? Oh, uh, huh. but you know, do they why why they do they why do they think about that the patient would have pheochromocytoma paraganglioma if they have a cyst? You know, well, so they had a CBT removed previously. So carotid body, they, they had one of those removed. Yeah, where they they is a carotid body tumor CBT, they and they had the mm -hmm. cyst in that uh, that location, or where where was no, the it cyst? Said, it says the cyst is on the kidney. Yeah, cyst is on the kidney, so they can have you know they should have genetic testing, and if the genetic testing comes up positive for some succinate dehydrogenase gene mutation. Sometimes VHL, sometimes TME and 127, but it's very, very rare, okay? You know, they, of course, ha could have uh, the uh, kidney cancer, okay? And, mm, but, mm. you know, it depends on the type of the cyst. There are some simple cysts, there are some complex cysts, you know, the cysts that they are not growing. Usually, uh, urologists would not operate on those patients. They would watch those cysts very carefully. If they are not growing, you know, they can be a real cyst, not actually the tumor, because the cystic tumor in the kidney, you know, is not coming, you know, so very, very often, but usually coming with those mutations that I outline, you know, so because, yes, they can have actually this type of problem. But I definitely doubt it's maybe coincidence to have, you know, the kidney cyst and uh, having, for example, a head and neck paraganglioma. They have to have genetic testing first, 
If the genetic testing is positive, yes, there is a little bit higher chance that this cyst can be complex cyst and can actually be a problematic in the in the in the future. We don't see renal cell cancer as a cystic cancer, but it still, mm. you know, we cannot rule it out, you know. So exceptions happen, right. so they have to be careful, but they have to be followed up very carefully. And usually urologists would actually suggest follow up unless the cyst is very big and it's affecting, for example, a renal parenchyma, that would be complicated, complicated, different scenario. Okay. Okay, well, let's do let's do one more. I'm gonna I'm gonna squeak one more in there. Do you have time? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. If a patient has a non-secreting, mm. non-genetic vagal para, do you recommend that they be blocked in general and or prior to any type of procedure or event? Yeah, my my quick an uh, the quick answer is so the uh, is no, no. Okay. Okay, they okay. don't have be they don't need to be actually blocked. They are cut, you know, biochemically silent. They don't have any positivity on metanephrines and catecholamines. There is no reason that those patients would be blocked. Okay. Okay. All right, let's see. Let's see if there's one more quick one. Uh, polyur what causes polyuria in the case of Fiopera? You know, not everybody has polyuria, you know, if they have a pheochromocytoma paraganglioma, but of course, you know, could actually happen because, you know, they are actually affecting the handling of the sodium and potassium and uh, could actually lead, you know, to polyuria. Uh, so, yes, there are some patients that they have it, but um, not really um, that I would have it on many patients. The number of the patients is uh, very small. Also, the pheochromocytoma <coughs> or paraganglioma can secrete, you know, certain substances that uh, actually can cause, uh, can cause polyuria. Uh, so, uh, but it's not very, it's not very typical. If somebody would have a, for example, fear with the Cushing syndrome, you know, with hyper hypercortisolemia, I would buy it and there would be definitely polyuria. But in terms of pheochromocytoma, paraganglioma itself, you know, it's not, uh, uh, it's not very common, but, you know, it's affecting uh, kidney, how the kidney is handling ions as well as water that could actually lead to polyuria. Okay. All right. I think that we have hit most of our main questions, the big ones, I think we have hit. There are many, many more, but we would be here for hours and hours and hours. So I think this is a good place for us to stop. And first, let me just say thank you so much. Uh, this is always a fun time of the year for, for me and for us to get together and have a chat. It's great to hear about the new things that are on the horizon for Fiopera. And uh, we thank you so much for your time and your dedication to your patients, to the Fiopera Alliance. Um, I don't think any of us would be where we were without you and your expertise. So thank you. And thank you for spending time with us today. Jonas, thank you so much for having me uh, here today. Uh, it was a really great pleasure and honor. I would like to thank you, of course, thank you of uh, Progenix as well as Fiopara Alliance uh, so sponsoring and supporting this, uh, this meeting. And of course, I would like to uh, thank uh, the patients as well, you know, so because without the patients, you know, I would maybe not talk, you know, so, um, <laughs> and, uh, so for very interesting, um, and I would say some of those questions were very good, very, very challenging and uh, always happy, you know, to help patients and uh, to support them. 
uh, many of uh, those patients, I'm pretty sure that they know me. If you, and because we could not go through all the questions and I understand, so, but they can always contact me. They have my email. If you don't have my email, you can actually connect with Shauna. You can connect with uh, Fiopara Alliance. They, they have uh, my full permission that they can uh, provide you with my email and you can uh, send me your uh, your question or your situation, describe your situation or worries or what you think, you know, that uh, could be done. And some of you, we will be, of course, happy to see here at the NIH. Finally, I would like to uh, thank everybody and wish everybody, including you, Shauna, you know, the progenics for your uh, alliance, few para alliance uh, members, uh, as well as patients, uh, very happy holiday season. And in case that uh, celebrating New Year, or at least I would put the new calendar year, because there is a new calendar <laughs> year, you know, to uh, to have a lot of prosperity, uh, happiness, and of course, if I would have, you know, just one wish for everybody. I would wish everybody, you know, very good health and stable health. And in case that you have, you know, some disease, and I know this is not easy, and it can be sometimes problematic, but if it would be stable, this is still a winning situation because it can be stable for 5, 10, 15, 20 years, and that would be uh, definitely uh, wonderful. So once again, it was a really great pleasure to be here with you and uh, to give this uh, uh, web, uh, webinar and to um, receive some uh, or um, very interesting and challenging questions. It was, as I said uh, several times, it was really a pleasure and honor. Thank you so much. Thank you. And this webinar is going to be available. So a few people have asked, are we recording it? Yes, we are recording it. It will be available. Give us a couple of days and we'll get it put up on YouTube. Um, we will also have a link from our website. So you can go to either place and you'll be able to find it. Make sure that you're following us on social media. Um, sign up for our e-newsletter. We give lots of announcements. I apologize that my screen is a little grainy. It looks like my internet might be going in and out. Um, but um, don't forget to use the hashtag Let's Talk About Nets. If you're out on social media, we are doing our fund drive, fundraising drive this time of the year. So please donate as you can to Fiopera Alliance. Um, this is your leading nonprofit that's helping to lead the way with research and advocacy uh, with Fio chromocytoma and paraganglioma. So we would appreciate any donations that you're able to do this time of the year. Again, special thanks to Progenics and special thanks to everyone who attended and for Dr. Pasak who shared his time, energy, talent, and knowledge with us today. Everyone have a happy holiday. Bye-bye.